Good morning. We're already en route. Because I wasn't going to do a video this morning. But then I thought, the last one we did was on uh, uh, green policy and the impossibility of going over to electric anytime soon. And then I thought, no, well, we'll do one on dentistry. First of all, I've got to say hello to all my fans in Gambia, because my uh, video where I talked about going to the Gambia got five times as many views as normal. So something, I've been, I'm, I'm viral in Banjul. Probably all the presidents, guards have, have been on the, been sent a copy with the orders to keep an eye out for me should I ever have the temerity to come back. But uh, anyway, if you live in Gambia or you're in the, on the Gambia network, you know what I mean, then uh, good morning to you from a rather chilly England, southeast corner where the temperature is about three degrees, feels like minus one, and next week it's going to go down to minus one or minus three. So you might have a bit of snow for you to look at. You'll, you'll never have seen that before. Anyway. No, what I want to talk, I am having an unseasonably large number of management problems come through the door at the moment in the way of patients, new patients. So, and while you get taught at dental school how to do root treatments and how you get taught how to do uh, notes and stuff like that, you don't really ever, well you weren't when I trained, taught how to deal with the psychology of people. And any uh, job that's a public facing job has, has a large element of psychology, probably 50% of it is psychology. And it's, uh, it was all kicked off by Mrs. Angry saying to me, yesterday she was at the hairdressers and, and a woman came in and said, I hate going to the dentist. And she said, they always say that. They don't say, I don't like going to the dentist or I you know, don't look forward to going to the dentist. They always say, I hate going to the dentist. And then proceeded to launch into some 20 minute diatribe about how her teeth were, you know, she got this gap missing here and a gap missing there and, and uh, all her dental problems. And it occurred to me that really when people say, I hate the dentist, what they're really saying is, I hate going to the dentist. I hate my teeth. That's what they're saying. I hate my teeth. And every time I go to the dentist, I get told how bad my teeth are or whatever, whatever. Now, this chimes with a patient who came in yesterday, young, what I call young man, probably in his 30s. Um, you know, uh, chef, Chefs are always a challenge, teeth-wise, because they're constantly tasting what they're cooking, and so they feed their germs the whole time, and so they tend to have more than average decay, let's put it that way. Um, the other people who've fallen into that group, I would say, are lorry drivers, who are, you know, have trouble with, um, how can I put it, you know, they manage to wash, but they don't manage to brush their teeth. They get so far, and then, and then, Oh, it looks like he's packing up the signal. Fair enough. So, um, yeah, so he's a chef. Oh, this is going to be fun, isn't it? Look, there's a lorry behind another lorry. Unless, oh, I see what they're doing. They're digging out the ditches. Yeah, fair enough. Well, good luck with that, mate. How are you going to get around there? I don't know, because he's planted there. He's got his um, legs down. Sorry, I digress. I do apologise. So, so you occasionally you get these young blokes in, very heavily tattooed normally, and say, you know, I know I've neglected my teeth for the last 20 years, I want to get them sorted out. And... Obviously, you know, it's like their teeth are in a bit of a state. They've got lots and lots of decayed teeth, roots, uh, brushing problems, diet problems, etc., etc. 
and almost invariably no money. Now, we, um, and it's not, you know, I don't blame them for having no money. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in any way sort of so despairing and say, oh, I never, never got any money. I'm not like that. I mean, these people, they're not, nobody in this country has got a culture of putting aside any money for their dentistry. You know, they're, they're lulled into this full sense of security by the NHS that dentistry is not something that they need to budget for. And then when they come to test out the, the veracity of that claim, they have found that it's sorely lacking, isn't it? So, so they don't, they don't, you know, they're left with bad teeth and no funds to um, rectify the situation and no NHS provision. So, what we do when we, uh, we, we do all our booking online now, you know, we occasionally book over the phone, but most of the time if someone wants an appointment, they go online, they put their details in, they say when they want to come in, and then we, we, we book them an appointment. But part of that online form is the last questionnaire which says, and it's optional, it says, if you had to choose between two of the three things, which is uh, quality, speed, and cost, which two would you choose? Because you can't have all three. You can't have high quality work uh, being done very cheaply, very quickly. Um, you have to choose high quality work done cheaply, but uh, over a period of time, or you can have high quality work done quickly if you don't mind paying whatever it costs to do it quickly. So, now although there are three variables in this, really the one variable that everybody selects is high quality. Because nobody, nobody says I want something that's quick and expensive and I don't worry, I'm not worried about the quality of it. Um, what they do is they all say high quality. So that's a bit of a uh, uh, misdirection, a bit of a red herring. What we're really interested in is, in addition to the quality, which are the other two they're interested in. Are they interested in low cost, or are they interested in uh, high? Uh, are they interested in low cost or high speed? So, and the patients gen generally tend to fall into two groups. Obviously, they um, ones who are have got money and want it done, you know, quickly, and then where money's not really an object, and yet. Uh, you've got the other group where uh, they recognize that they've got no money and so they always think no I want high quality but um, low cost and I'm not worried about how long it takes now in practice it doesn't really impact how long it takes Do you know I mean I can for example I can sometimes say to people um, you know it, well, let, let's put it this way. If someone wants like a denture and they think they want it done in a day, for example, then we can organize it in a day. But if they want to save 200 quid, they can have it done over four weeks, uh, over four visits and uh, save themselves 200 quid, you know? In the same way as someone who needs an inlay can have a composite inlay for 200 pound less than they can have a ceramic inlay for. So this, these are the sort of choices that you could offer to people. But when you get someone in who's obviously got a ton of work and and a desire to have all their teeth fixed and and has ticked the box saying that they want high quality but they want it low cost, then obviously that leaves you with a, like trying to square the circle, doesn't it, of the funding issue. Now, it wasn't helped by the fact that I, I, I explained to him, it took a long time, I explained to him why his lower teeth were not too bad, where his upper teeth were wrecked because of the calcium levels in his saliva and all sorts of stuff that he'd never heard from anyone. And while some of his previous dentists had done some pretty good jobs in that they've done amalgam fillings and they've done, he's got the odd crown in there that was uh, that's pretty, done pretty well. Uh, nobody's ever really had a, sat down and had a chat with him about brushing or diet or anything. So as a result, his fillings are all still falling out and he's got decayed teeth and he's got retained roots and all sorts of stuff. So it was a bit of a dichotomy of a mouth, because it's like the curate's egg. It was good in parts. So he. So what I do is I just basically say, look, you know, there's no point trying plan A, B, and C. We might as well go straight to plan X, Y, and Z. Based on 42 years worth of experience, so you're going to go to some sort of. Because uh, he said he was having trouble eating. So I said, in, on the basis that you're having trouble eating, we're going to have to put some more teeth in, and the best way to do it is some partial denture, some sort of partial acrylic denture. 
and it's quite true you don't have to do everything for the, every patient on the first visit I mean basically just getting his plaque under control his gum disease slowed down his decay rate slowed down his diet under control getting the uh, decay uh, stabilized even with temporary fillings if necessary um, extracting roots septic roots and stuff like that um, would be would be more than enough for one course of treatment but he's obviously done a bit of Google foo and he and then he said to me why well, I'd ideally uh, you know, if I'm going to have anything done, I'd rather have all the upper teeth out. Now, this is predicated on um, the assumption that having all his upper teeth out is going to be the end of his problems. In the same way as if you've got a bunch of rubbish and you say, I'm going to have a bonfire and get, clear that, get rid of that rubbish. And then that'll be the end of the, you know, the problem. Whereas what, <coughs> excuse me, what people don't understand is that dentures are not the end of the problem, they're just the start of another problem, which is the problem is you've got dentures. So there he is saying that the solution that he's got in mind is, um, uh, you know, is another problem. Well, I know to be another problem. So first of all, you know, I said to him, um, you know, I know you think that you want to have all your teeth out because they've given you so much trouble and you've spent money and it's been, you poured, but you know, good money after bad in, in where the fillings have fallen out and you've paid for them to be redone, etc. And I said, and I know you're fed up with your teeth and you don't love your teeth and you think that you were at the end of the queue when it came to giving out teeth. But I said, let me tell you that, uh, and also I said, you know, almost everybody in your situation says the same thing. I shall be glad to see the back of them. I shall be, when when my teeth have gone, that will be the happiest day of my life when I have the last tooth pulled out. And, you know, and I say to these people, I, I can make you dentures. And, you know, it's possible that you'll be able to eat anything you like with these dentures, but it's far more likely that you won't. And that dentures are only the next best thing to no teeth. People don't wear dentures because they're a good idea. They wear them because without them, they would have no teeth and, and have an even worse time of trying to eat. So dentures are just the next best thing to no teeth. They're not a substitute for real teeth. You know, the best implants are your natural implants. Well, he says, all right, well, if I don't want to wear dentures, what about implants? So you do, do you do all this all on four, I think? So I said, no, we don't because we don't, I mean it's a specialist, it's a specialist thing, I'd rather leave it to uh, people who do a fair bit of it because it would, be, it would only be like one or two cases a year and the GDC are never going to support me are they, if I'm doing two cases a year they'll, they'll say no, Mr Watson succumbed to greed and decided to take on a case that was beyond him clinically uh, due to his lack of experience, this tiny thing went wrong and so now uh, we're going to strike him off. That's basically what the GDC would say about that. I'll tell you that. So I said, no, but you know, I know about all on fours. And if you want to, then, you know, you'd have to go and see someone else for an all on four, but you know, probably to Turkey, I suppose, on the financial grounds. But, um, you know, if you've got the odd 10,000 or 20,000 lying around in your bank account to get that done, then, then great, which of course he doesn't. Now, given their due, patients who you explain that dentures are not the nirvana that they expect are generally pretty quick to come around to your point of view. They'll, they'll quite quickly say, okay, I appreciate what you're saying about dentures and it might not be what I want. Because um, you can't, once you've got dentures, you know, there's no going back really for the most part for these people. He's going to have dentures from his 30s until his 80s or whatever. And a lot of chefs do. And that's just a fact. But um, anyway, I said what I'll do is I'll, I'll come up with some sort of treatment plan and it'll involve sorting out your problems, uh, stabilising everything, making you some dentures, and then I said, and then if you do lose another tooth, then you don't have to have another set of dentures made. We can just add it on. This is the whole point about acrylic dentures. They are 
flexible in terms of their use, uh, of their, their uh, ability to be adapted to future circumstances. They really are, for some people, they really are the best thing, you know, especially if you put a couple of roach clasps on them and, and uh, so that they stay in a bit better. But being an upper one, that wasn't really ever going to be a problem. But anyway, um, so he's gone away to think about it all and decide what he's going to do. But it's only because I've been in the job a long time that I was able to start off on the right foot with him and sort of talk him through it, talk him through all the options because he really, you know, he didn't. He had a bunch of ideas about what he wanted. Basically, get rid of the teeth was the, uh, you know, in the same same way as the woman in the hairdressers wanted to just be gone, you know, who will rid me of this uh, turbulent set of teeth. Um, and um, I've got another new patient at 8.45 this morning, and God knows what that's going to throw at me. But I tell you, from a dental point of view, it's, not, it's probably not going to be much of a challenge. But from a management point of view, these patients are driving me nuts. Driving me nuts. I had a woman in the other day, lovely lady, Russian lady, uh, needed a tooth out, lower right seven, big decayed cavity, infected. Fortunately, not very difficult extraction. Get a, get a pair of eagle beaks on it, and it came out buckly without too much trouble. And she was like, after she's like, well, that was brilliant. How did you do that? You know, the last tooth that I had to have taken out, you know, they had to get it out with a pneumatic jackhammer, and that one came straight out. Why? Why was that? Why was that? You know, she's a very inquisitive patient. Wants to know everything, every single thing, every single thing. Every, honestly, I'm not kidding, every aspect of the treatment, she asked me why I was doing that, why I was doing that, why I was doing that. And that is, I think it is, this, this an Eastern European mindset, which is, uh, it takes a lot of getting used to, you know, it's very blunt, very forward, it's very, appears at times to our um, uh, ears to be rude, you know, quite offensive, in that, and it feels like we're being questioned all the time. And I've got this, the same with this other Ukrainian lady who, you know, still, uh, we're still having uh, trouble getting her crown to fit because she's got such a reduced OVD. Um, and, you know, telling her that she's lost all this enamel and she must be drinking something acidic. Like, no, she says she isn't. She only has the occasional tr cranberry juice. So we looked up cranberry juice and it was... It's 2.5 pH and contains four organic acids I've never even heard of. So, you know, that's obviously the cause. Um, and then in addition to that, um, she's got a, she had a root treated upper left eight, which, and I'm like, what dentist would root treat an upper left eight? And she said, oh, well, a Ukrainian dentist, because they're much better than English dentists. And I said, look, there's only one reason a dentist would root treat an upper left eight, and that's because he's, he's after the money. The correct treatment for an upper left eight that needs root treatment is extraction. It is under no circumstances is it root filling. Oh, but no, you know, I, but I'm only saying that because I'm an English dentist and I'm a, I'm a poor dentist. And she'd had a chat with all her Ukrainian friends and they've all uh, decided that since they come to the UK, they've had to have nothing but dental work done. And, um, and uh, they've all decided that it's because dental, uh, the dentists in the UK are um, poor quality and uh, looking for work, you know, and tending to try and uh, find things wrong. So, uh, for example, she's got early occlusal caries in her upper right seven, to the point where the probe goes through and sticks in the occlusal pit. Well, I mean, I did this five times and I said to her, can you see what I mean. When I say the probe goes and gets stuck in the tooth, that's a sign of early decay. She's like, well, I've got no pain from that tooth. And I said, no, that's right. You don't really get pain until you need a root filling. And the idea is that we try and diagnose these bits of decay first and and fix them before you need a root filling, you know. So, but she's still looking at me like I've... <laughs> she's still looking at me like I'm... I'm David Blaine, 
and I've got a, a special magic sticky probe that I use to convince patients they need filling when they don't. And in addition, she's got the most massive DO on her upper left seven, which I can't, I can, the only reason I can assume that that's not causing her trouble is because the nerve has died in that upper left seven. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, she must have had it when she was in Ukraine. So, so I've got a, a Ukrainian dentist who's looked at this upper left eight and seven and has, instead of filling the seven and taking out the eight, has root treated the eight and not, and not done anything on the seven. Now, give him credit, he may be that she left Ukraine before he could fill that seven. But really, I mean, when he was root treating the eight, he, he probably should have told her that she had decay in the seven, needed filling. But I know, I know he's probably had it on his list of things, of teeth to root treat. <laughs> Anyway, she's not going to be happy if I tell her it needs root filling. We've had enough trouble with this uh, with this crown, reduced height crown. <clears throat> but you know, she's like, oh well, and she did it again. She said, you know, uh, my Ukrainian dentist would have fixed this by now. And that if you ever, you know, want to come to Ukraine, I'll be happy to introduce you to my Ukrainian dentist, who could show you how we work in Ukraine, how we do everything's much better than you do in the UK. So. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, she obviously has absolutely zero confidence in me uh, personally as a representative of UK dentists, you know, the UK dentists in general. I'm not going to take it personally, but she just thinks I'm a typical UK dentist and that I am useless. And uh, my attitude to her is that, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, take on a patient who's had like eight root fillings already and is only... 50 and there's eight of her teeth root filled including an upper left eight which I had to take out and um, and, and and a massive untreated caries and uh, erosion which must have been going on for some years which you know she's in denial about and uh, and uh, upper right four which is a root which is practically hollow underneath the gum which I am now trying to put a technically quite difficult crown on and which she keeps you know tutting and rolling her eyes and saying um, hello we seem to have some sort of protest going on at the school either that or they're selling uh, something or other oh. school strike pay up pay up pay up National Education Union. Okay, that's probably different from the National Union of Teachers, I suppose. Oh, I might go down and talk to them lunchtime if they're uh, if they're still on the picket line. That'd be quite funny, wouldn't it? Anyway, yeah. So she's not no confidence in my work. So. What I'll do is I'll complete this course of treatment and then when she's dentally fit, I'll then tell her she'd be better off with someone in whom she has more confidence. Uh, I can't. I can't be doing with this. My, uh, what's the what's the word they use these days when you're getting, when you're a bit fed up? My mental health is suffering. My mental health is suffering. Okay. See you soon, bye.